So we finished our first video with this uh, contemplation from Prufrock that what if his life, this very personal consideration of the value of his individual life, what if in this modern world, ultimate meaning systems and value systems are no longer accessible to me? And what if my life can be easily measured, not by the strength of my character or the um, relationship of faith with God, but what if it can be measured out simply with coffee spoons? How then, with that knowledge, should I presume? So that question becomes much more daunting, much more crippling and overwhelming in light of these realizations that Prufrock is, is coming to. We have a series of stanzas here where he employs this rhetorical device of synecdoche, where he sort of compartmentalizes the people he's around in terms of their discrete parts. Uh, so synecdoche is the rhetorical strategy in which the part of a thing comes to represent its whole. And so here, the voices in the room, the eyes in the room, the arms in the room where he is, take on their own sense of aggressive identity in life by acting on their own. He says, I know the voices, but they are dying with a dying fall beneath the music from a farther room. So the voices are muffled and the voices are distant. And at the end of this poem, he'll reference the human voices that wake us and we drown from our uh, achings and yearnings for, uh, for metaphysical transcendent purpose. Now he says, I've known the eyes already, known them all. The eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase. And when I am formulated, sprawling on a pen, when I am pinned and wriggling on the wall, then how should I begin to spit out all the butt ends of my days and ways? And notice this sense of revelation, confession, self-reflection, the way in which we might articulate who we are to others and express ourselves to others is, is described as spitting out the butt ends of my days and ways. It's a very negative portrayal of what it means to be able to articulate and express who you are successfully to someone else. That the means of communication we have to connect, to make meaningful connections with one another, what if those have been completely fractured and we no longer are able to communicate with one another? Later, he'll say, it's impossible to say just what I mean. That this ability to communicate might be completely uh, decimated forever by virtue of being in the modern world. But here he gives us an interesting image where the eyes in the room, again, these are not, uh, these are not the gentle... Um, eyes of fellow beings within a harmonious whole. These are eyes that are operating on their own uh, as parts of these, these other people that are fixing him to the wall. You get this very um, uh, morbid and depressing view of the kinds of thing you might have in entomology where you pin insects to styrofoam uh, when I was in elementary school, we had to do that sort of thing in science classes where you took these insects and pinned them into styrofoam and labeled them accordingly, and they're just sprawled out against the styrofoam. You get that same sort of um, hostile image from Prufrock here that these eyes in the room are fixing me to the wall with these formulated phrases, that they are labeling, uh, they are labeling who and what I am. They are uh, assigning to me what I am according to their assessment and their perception of me. They see my bald spot, they see my modest dress, they see my weak arms and legs, and they are pinning me to the wall, deciding for me who and what I am and what my value is. He says, the eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase, and when I am formulated, 
that being formulated, being um, defined by others is like being pinned sprawling against a wall, pinned and wriggling on the wall with no knowledge of how to begin to express who I am. That he cannot declare to others successfully what he's feeling or what he's thinking. He's crippled by indecisions, a hundred indecisions. He's crippled by fears of his own inadequacy. And it's very much predicated on his appearance. Earlier, he talked about time to prepare a face, that there will be time to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. So again, some synecdoche there, where this room full of human beings is not a room of a community or anything like fellow feeling. This is a room of people, all of whom are individually preparing faces to encounter the other faces. This is a room full of masked people, all of whom have strategically and carefully constructed faces to meet the faces that you meet. So now we have Prufrock saying that I cannot successfully express who I am. I have to prepare a face. I have to hide behind all of these carefully constructed uh, features of my appearance that will communicate for me and the society I'm in will do the same that they will create their own system of, of formulations for what I am and those formulations will pin me to the wall and their definitions of who I am will be what they think of me rather than my ability to actually articulate what I am and what I feel and what I desire to them so the inability to communicate across this room becomes this microcosm for a human problem in the modern world. Suppose our suspicions of one another, suppose our inability to, re to relate to one another successfully has made us all functional animals, where we are in this jungle where the alpha males will be successful. They'll, they will be able to get the girl and they'll go home happy and the proof rocks of the world will drown in this weight of, of anxieties and despairs. So again, the question comes. Remember, it's an overwhelming question. It doesn't go away. How should I presume? How shall I begin? What shall I say? What is it? And how do I know it? He goes on. I've known the arms already, known them all. Arms that are braceleted and white and bare but in the lamplight, downed with light brown hair. They appear to be these classical images of beauty. They appear, they appear to be inviting. They appear to be um, enticing. And yet, when exposed to the light, there might be something there that we did not know before. He's going to do the same thing with himself, with the magic lantern, which is a, a reference to these old-fashioned movie cameras um, that were quite new and innovative at the time. And he'll say, it's as if a magic lantern threw the nerves in patterns on a screen where his entire nervous system is going to be fleshed out on this movie screen and exposed for everyone to see. And again, he's going to be this patient that is analyzed, studied, dissected by others, the eyes of others, these eyes that fix you and dissect you and prod you and examine your nervous system without your consent, without your ability to weigh in on it or to chime in with your romantic notions of self. Um, those days perhaps are gone forever. Here he says again, is it perfume from a dress that makes me so digress? Are all of these internal digressions um, merely responses to external stimuli? Is it perfume? Is it these chemical compulsions, these compounds that are having an effect on my brain? Am I even in charge or in control of my thoughts and my body anymore? Or am I merely a subject to my environment? This goes back to the uh, views of naturalists the generation before. Figures like Jack London, Stephen Crane, William James, Mark Twain, these, uh, these writers in America that had considered man to be hu a human beast, 
that man is completely uh, subject to his make, his environment, um, his DNA, his genes. Freud also, that what if you are merely subject to your um, biological impulses and these unconscious desires you have that you, you're not even conscious of them. So of course you can't manage them or manipulate them. They are unconscious. So he says, is it perfume from a dress that makes me digress? Arms that lie along a table or wrap about a shawl. And should I then presume, how do I move forward? How do I begin? Shall I say I have gone at dusk through narrow streets and watched the smoke that rises from the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning out of windows? He says, no, I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the floors of silent seas. So notice how he is envying this subhuman existence. Because remember, humanity, the human being, is burdened with the weight of consciousness. We are self-aware. We recognize our face in the mirror. We don't just make these instinctual choices like animals do. We're able to contemplate the weight of those choices, reflect on them, wonder if we made the right choice or not. And that burden of consciousness for Prufrock perhaps is becoming a burden that is too heavy to bear. He says, I, rather than being a human, crippled by the weight of anxieties and fears and regrets and indecision and inaction, disappointment, disillusionment, what I should have been is a pair of ragged claws, some more synecdoche as well. He doesn't even say a crab, he says a pair of claws scuttling across the floor of silent seas. Perhaps in silence and in solitude, is the only possibility of comfort. Because when you are not in solitude, when you're not in solitude, which Prufrock isn't, he's in this social setting, uh, you have the weight of other eyes, other, other consciousnesses that are judging, evaluating, formulating you, and you have to worry about what they think. In solitude, you don't have that that sense of social expectation and failure. And also in silence, you don't have to worry about expressing or articulating yourself. You can just exist. You can just be. You can be reduced to a mere creature that his entire life is just a matter of reflexes and instincts, staying alive, eating, drinking, procreating, just survival methods. That's it. You don't have to worry about contemplation or identity at all. And the afternoon, the evening, sleeps so peacefully, smoothed by long fingers, asleep, tired, or it malingers. Maybe it is just feigning sleep. So again, this sense of lulling, this sense of um, etherized, the patient etherized upon the table, stretched on the floor, here beside you and me. Should I... Remember, this is human as well, thinking in terms of moral categories. Animals, their thought is restricted to mere responses to stimulation. Here's what we do and don't do, given the circumstance. We, there's fight or flight, there's reflexes, there's instinctual action. Uh, humans think of what we ought to do, what we should be. And so Prufrock can't escape this human impulse for meaning, moral obligations to the universe, to his fellow beings, to himself. Should I, after tea and cake and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis? But though I have wept and fasted, wept and prayed, again, these human categories, weeping, agonizing over what we ought to do, who we ought to be, though I have seen my head, some more synecdoche there, grown slightly bald, brought in upon a platter, I am no prophet, and here is no great matter. So here's his allusion to John the Baptist. That great prophet in the New Testament who is martyred for his witnessing to the Messiah, that Jesus is the Lamb of God 
who takes away the sins of the world. John the Baptist makes these great declarations of faith and certainty. Behold the Lamb of God. This is the Messiah. He is greater than I. He is declaring, and uh, he's the voice of one crying in the wilderness, preparing the way for the Lord. That his life has great purpose. That his matter is great. Prufrock says, I've seen my head brought in upon a platter, but I am no prophet. I am not some forerunner to great purposes. I don't carry some great message of meaning. Later on, he'll say, he is not Lazarus, come back from the dead to tell all. I don't have the answer to the great question, like John the Baptist did, like Lazarus did. I am no prophet. So rather than being a martyr for a great cause, Prufrock says, I'm just merely examined and dissected to death. Remember, my head on the platter is the one that everyone will notice as having a bald spot. I'm, I'm the one who will be nitpicked and rejected. So, I'm no pro prophet, here is no great matter. Do I dare disturb the universe? I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker, and I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker, and in short, I was afraid. So, like Hamlet, we have this contemplation of death. Hamlet will uh, hold the skull of Yorick up and look face to face at the image of his own mortality. He'll say, alas, poor Yorick, I knew him, Horatio. Uh, he has these great contemplations of to die, to sleep, to sleep, perchance to dream. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come? And we've shuffled off this mortal coil. But for Prufrock, he says, I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker. What if I am not great? How can there be anything like greatness in this modern world? And therefore I have seen the eternal footman, the, the servant at the door holding my coat for my exit. And he's holding my coat for me and snickering. And in short, I was afraid that... Uh, to think of Shakespeare's other great play, Macbeth, where at the end of the play, Macbeth says, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And he says, life is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. That what if our life is this short tale, but not meaningful, not great, but it's full of sound and fury. It sounds meaningful. There's great desire and stress and um, yearning in this life. But what if it signifies nothing? What if it is no great matter? And therefore, it cannot be a great tragedy. Uh, again, thinking of Aristotle's definition of tragedy uh, in his poetics, that uh, when you think of Hamlet and Macbeth and so on, that for Aristotle, tra the tragedy, what makes something a tragedy is that it's the fall of a hero from a great height. It was a hero who had great rank or great potential. This was Oedipus. This was Hamlet. This was somebody who fell from a great height. But Prufrock says, well, my life, my exit is humorous. It's pathetic. It's Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot, if you know that play. It, it is not a great height that I'm falling from. And therefore, it is not a great matter, my life. This is the love song, not of a great king or emperor, but of J. Alfred Prufrock, a nobody from nowhere. And would it have been worth it after all, after the cups, the marmalade, the tea, among the porcelain, among some talk of you and me, would it have been worthwhile to have bitten off the matter with a smile? to have squeezed the universe into a ball, to roll it towards some overwhelming question. Again, to try to take these, these magnificent contemplations of philosophical and theological matter and to bite them off and roll them into some manageable piece to try to answer these great questions. And again, he is not John the Baptist, and he realizes, I am not Lazarus. He's biblical analogies to say I am Lazarus come from the dead come back to tell you all I shall tell you all but Prufrock can't tell us all he doesn't know he doesn't know 
his own immediate circumstance. He doesn't know if he can dare to do the work of the next minute, much less to know all that lies in life and the afterlife, like Lazarus would know. I cannot tell you the physical world, much less the metaphysical, much less the spiritual. I can't tell you who I am, so how could I possibly know what the soul contains and the weight of it? Would it have been worthwhile if one, settling a pillow by her head, her head should say, that is not what I meant at all, that is not it at all? And would it have been worth it after all? Would it have been worthwhile after the sunsets and the dooryards and the sprinkled streets, after the novels, after the teacups, after the skirts that trail along the floor, all of the, the minutia of his given day, his given moment, and this and so much more, it is impossible to say just what I mean. I think we are forced at that moment to reckon with the potential of that statement. Suppose it is impossible to say just what I mean. Just think of the nature of language, where all of us, in order to articulate what we think, what we believe, who we are, we must use words, and words are tremendously slippery things. And how often have we failed at communicating because we can't quite find the right words to perfectly encapture what it is that we're intending? Um, words have connotations. Words change over time. Words are uh, subject to their translation. Uh, languages uh, are uh, difficult to translate. Uh, it's difficult to capture the essences of things versus the literal rendering of things. Um, and on the social level, human beings find themselves constantly in settings where they recognize that the person with whom they're speaking does not understand what they're trying to say. And that can cause great frustration, great distress. And so proof rock is thwarted at every turn by the difficulties of language. And the ultimate irony is that all of this is mediated to us through a poem where proof rock is trying to cut from feeling to feeling, scene to scene, moment to moment, to articulate what he's feeling. And you and I are at a loss to follow the stream of his argument. So if it's impossible to say just what I mean, then what do we do with meaning? Objectively, if all of us are subjectively appropriating it with our particular minds, our particular perceptions, our particular languages, um, on what basis can we establish true and genuine connection with one another if this is the case? So that's the fear of the modern world is that we no longer are able to commune with one another because we're no longer able to communicate with one another. But as if a magic lantern threw the nerves and patterns on a screen, Prufrock feels exposed utterly, subject to other people's perceptions of him with no ability, no capacity to communicate his own expression successfully. Would it have been worthwhile if one settling a pillow or throwing off a shawl and turning toward the window should say, that is not it. That is not it at all. That is not what I meant at all. Again, these pronouns, the overwhelming question at the beginning of the pronoun, the beginning of the poem was, what is it? All of it. What is it? And so here, what if this person I'm speaking to says, that is not it? And what if rather than harmony and relationship and um, community formed and unity around a, a, a truth, what if that idea that humans had adopted for thousands of years, that there is objective truth and it is knowable, um, what if we've come to this moment where we are so fragmented and alienated that there is no means of uh, establishing connection anymore with our fellow humans? Well, how, does one, how do we thrive? How do we create a flourishing world? At that point, we just become marbles in a box. These uh, at absolutely atomized individuals bumping into 
other atomized individuals, and there's no sense of organic uh, community yet, yet left for us to rely on. So he says, no, I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. Again, that infinitive strikes us with this reference to Hamlet. Hamlet's great contemplation was to be or not to be. So now for Prufrock, if he is not Prince Hamlet, if he is not a hero, if he is not a protagonist of any story, if he is not some great figure, he's not John the Baptist, he's not Michelangelo, he's not Lazarus, he's not Hamlet, and he was not meant to be that, he says, well, maybe I'm an attendant, Lord, one that will do to swell a progress, start a scene or two, advise the prince, no doubt an easy tool, rather condescending way of viewing his own purpose and his teleology, his existence. Deferential, glad to be of use, right, a tool to be of use. Politic, cautious and meticulous, full of high sentence, but a bit obtuse. All right, it sounds a little bit like Polonius and Hamlet. All right, somebody who's full of sound and fury, somebody who says things that sound like they could be good, but yet are actually substanceless, at times, indeed, almost ridiculous, almost at times, the fool. And again, there's our, our sense of the modern world. Uh, I referenced Samuel Beckett earlier. Um, there are, there's a great tradition of modernist and postmodernist theater uh, that takes this idea of man being um, a, a fool that inhabits a cosmos that is utterly indifferent to his um, sufferings. Waiting for Gatto is, is a great Beckett play for that. He also has a short sketch called Act Without Words, one. Uh, that's a great contemplation of the same theme. So Prufrock examines his mortality. I grow old, I grow old. I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. Now look what's happened to his great contemplations, his indecisions, his decisions of what to do with his life. What has once been the option of disturbing the universe? Do I dare disturb the universe? Do I dare dis disturb uh, the cosmic scene with the weight of what I say and do? Uh, can I make some great statement or action that will give my life purpose and validation? Now those questions have been reduced to, shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? So now, disturbing the universe and eating the peach have been given equal bearing for proof rock. Well, do I dare to eat a peach or do I not? If I eat a peach, what will, will I be hungry still or sh and should I eat something else? Or do I, should I not eat it? Uh, these are the questions that now have become the focus of his meditation. Not the value of human life, the nature of identity and knowledge and purpose. Now it's, well, how should I part my hair? Should I eat the peach? I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. I've heard the mermaids singing, each to each. I do not think that they will sing to me. So again, this, these uh, romantic impulses he has carried over from Odysseus, right? I've heard the mermaids calling, this reference to sirens. I, I, I have, uh, let us go then, you and I. This grand quest awaits, right? All this romantic language of, uh, of these older traditions of literature and story. And then Prufrock realizes, well, I do not think that they will sing to me. I will not be the subject of some great song. Uh, this is the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, and yet it's a poem where uh, the possibilities of love have been thwarted at every turn. He is unsuccessful. He is left talking to the reader or talking to himself. He's stuck inside this internal monologue that never goes anywhere. And so this is no great love song. Prufrock does not have some great Penelope waiting for him on the other side. 
he does not have any sort of mythical or metaphysical voices calling to him uh, that his moment of greatness flickers and then he exits the door with the eternal footman snickering. I have seen them riding seaward on the waves, combing the white hair of the waves blown back. When the wind blows the water white and black, we have lingered in the chambers of the sea by sea girls wreathed with seaweed, red and brown. You hear the quality of this poem. We have lingered in the chambers of the sea by sea girls wreathed with seaweed, red and brown. That you have this lasting image of proof rock at the beach looking out at the immensity of the ocean and contemplating what is out there. Is there something on the horizon calling my name, summoning me forth into this great uh, quest, into this great um, journey of teleological purpose? And is there a goal to my life? Is there some great end I was meant to achieve? And so he has these mythical, romantic um, voices calling out to him in his mind, in his imaginative capacity, imagining himself being someone that the mermaids would sing to, in contrast to this modern recognition that they don't sing to me. Uh, I am completely cut off from all of those generations before, that the modern world is this wasteland that has nothing in common anymore with the traditions of the past. He says, we've lingered in the chambers of the sea by sea girls wreathed with seaweed until human voices wake us and we drown. You can imagine Proof Rock lost in this wishful thinking that he may yet be some grand figure who has been summoned by the gods summoned by the sea girls toward this great uh, voyage into the beyond and forever after. And it's when he hears the human voices, the women coming and going, talking of Michelangelo, these other figures at this party in, in England on this one October night, that he is startled out of his imaginative romantic contemplations, and he is drowning in this modern world of white noise, voices upon voices, uh, atomized individual marbles bumping into one another, measuring out the days and weeks and months and years of their lives with coffee spoons. <laughs>